Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. We got another hot panel for you today. And once again, it is talking about CC0, though not exclusively CC0. I am here with several lawyers who specialize in intellectual property law, and then Max Kernan, <laughs> the non lawyer <laughs> of the group. I'll introduce the each of these folks. Land. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll introduce everyone here individually. And then really the goal here today is to answer all of your questions when it comes to intellectual property and the law. So we're going to talk all about trademark versus copyright, how that impacts everything that's happening right now with CC0. We're going to get into some very specific hypothetical and non-hypothetical scenarios regarding Moonbirds and Board Ape Yacht Club and, uh, and maybe other projects here. And then I want to talk more broadly about the call it enforceability challenges we have right now, or, or just some of the broader legal challenges that don't get talked about enough in the space. Uh, so I want to, I'll, I'll introduce you each in a second, but just thank you all so much for being here first and foremost. Thanks, Carly. Thanks for having us. Thanks for all right. having us. Joining me on the panel today, we have Alex Modell. He is the COO of Remaster and a, a trained lawyer, Remaster. We also have our the CEO of Remaster, Max Kernan here. Remaster is uh, providing solutions for some of these issues we're going to talk about here today. We have Jeremy Goldman, who is an IP lawyer focused in copyright and technology at Frankfurt, Kernick, Klein, and Sells. And he has really developed a practice that is entirely supporting Web3 projects at this point. He is in the room where many of these conversations are happening with many of these leading NFT projects. So he is likely not going to talk in specifics with us here about any particular projects that he may or may not be repping, uh, but he can speak uh, broadly on these things very well. Uh, we have Daniel Barsky, who is an IP and technology lawyer at Holland and Knight. He is also the co-director of the startup clinic at the University of Miami. And uh, missing here is Sarah Odenkirk. I'm sorry that uh, <laughs> we got times mixed up. You were on a plane. She was not able to join us today. Uh, we are about to dive into all this, but first we do need to hear a word from our lovely, lovely sponsors. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses who need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage their treasury and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the extremely secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single chain treasuries to expressive, flexible, multi-chain features such as global user management, global contracts, proposal management, and many other features that can be changed shared across an entire organization. CoinShift layers on powerful treasury management tools on top of the proven security of Gnosis Safe, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Mazari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. In DeFi, you have to keep up with the frontier and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on, and now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. Okay, I want to start here today by really just level setting and, and diving into what are the like verticals within law that make up intellectual property? Spoiler alert, I happen to know I think it's like patents, uh, trademarks, and copyrights. And then really have you guys break down what a trademark is, what a copyright is, um, and maybe what we need to understand about these two as we engage in this conversation. Um, Jeremy, do you want to kick us off there? Sure. Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, the trifecta of uh, U.S. intellectual property, uh, copyright, trademark, patent. Uh, we could put patents aside for the moment, for the most part. Patents cover inventions, right? And a patent is something that only you only get when you go through the process of putting an application into the patent and trademark office, and they come back and they grant you a patent. It's a pretty long, arduous process. That covers ideas that rise to the level of inventions. And um, we can really put that aside. That's really not at issue here. So then we're dealing with the other two, copyrights and trademarks. 
and they're really different. They cover very, very different things. And it's really important that, uh, that folks understand what they cover. And there's going to be some bleed over here when we talk about the concepts ahead. So let's start with trademark, actually. And trademark is, a, uh, is used to identify the source of a good or service. That's what a trademark is, right? It's a, it's a name. It's a logo. It's an identifier, something that people, the public, consumers can see and use it to identify who is the source of this good or service. And that's so that's what it covers. And with a trademark, you can obtain a trademark right without going through the registration process of going to the patent and trademark office and filling out the papers and getting a registration in your trademark. You can get a trademark just by using something in commerce that people start to identify with your product or service. So that's trademark. And copyright, totally different. Copyright covers expression that is fixed in a tangible medium, right? So what we're talking about there are your paintings, is your art, photographs, motion pictures, uh, video games, anything that you take, when you take an idea, you have to express it and put it in some creative way onto a page. So when you just say something out loud, if it's not recorded, you, there's no copyright. But the minute that you take an idea or you and you put it onto a page and it has a modicum of creativity, a modicum of originality, you automatically, the author of that, obtains the copyright in that. And that's what copyright protects. And copyright is often described, the way I describe it and lots of people, is you can think about it like a bundle of sticks because it's not really a monolith, it's a bundle of sticks. And each of those sticks represents an exclusive right to that, that only you have the right to do and to authorize others to do things with it. The biggest one is like copying, right? When you create something and you put it on the page, only you get to decide that you want to make copies of it or to authorize someone else to make copies of it or to distribute it or to sell it or to perform it or to publicly display it or to make a derivative right, to make a new creation, a new work that's based upon the original. All of those bundle of rights, each of those is an individual stick over which the author has the exclusive right for a certain period of time. And so that's what a copyright is. And just like with a trademark, you don't need to do anything in order to obtain ownership over your copyright, but you can go to the Copyright Office of the United States, and here we're talking about US law, you can go to the United States, to the Copyright Office, put in an application to get a registration in your copyright, and that will give you certain benefits and, privilege, and privileges, including, very importantly, the right to sue someone for using your copyright-protected work without permission, and the right to get things like statutory damages and attorney's fees. So it is sort of advisable if you have a valuable piece of um, property that's protected by copyright, you can go and get a copyright registration, but you don't need to. So just summing it up, copyright protecting expressive works of authorship, trademark protects, it's a source of a good or a service. It's an identifier that identifies with a consumer source of good or service, patent covers inventions. So that's that's sort of the, the sum up there of IP in the US. Well, and just a follow up to that, Jeremy. So if you did not file with the copyright office, are your rights different and what are they? So you're, I mean, you, the copy the nature of the copyright doesn't change, but your ability to enforce your copyright is severely limited because if you don't get a copyright registration in the United States, if you're a U.S. person and you author something here in the U.S. and, and you cannot go to court and to stop someone from using your work unless you get that copyright registration, um, the additional benefits and privileges that you get in terms of what kind of damages you can seek, right? Whether you can, whether you have to just get actual damages or statutory damages, that also will, you know, change depending on whether you get your copyright registration or not. But something that I hear a lot, and, and I'm sure Daniel hears all the time, is like, do I have to? I want to go and get a copyright in this thing or that thing. It's all kind of a misnomer because the important thing to understand is that pretty much everywhere in the world now. The United States wasn't like this always, but we have been for, for a, a while now. The minute that, the second, the instant 
that you take your original expression and you put it in a fixed tangible medium, you put it on paper, you record it on the hard drive, you capture it on the, on the, uh, in the camera, you are the copyright owner, right? You don't need to do anything else to uh, assert ownership over that, over that work. And, I, and just following on, that's what makes copyrights different than really the other two types of intellectual property. We haven't touched on trade secrets. They're irrelevant here. But if I come up in my mind, if I have a great invention, I write it down on a piece of paper, it doesn't give me a patent in that, right? Unless I take it over to the patent office. If I have an idea for a great brand or you know, or a great tagline that I want to use for my company and I write it down on a piece of paper, but I don't go out and use it in commerce, I don't have a trademark on it. But in both of those instances, when I wrote it down on the piece of paper, I have a copyright. It just automatically comes into being uh, in term, just by my fixing it in a tangible medium. Boom, there you go, copyright. And it writes a fix immediately. Again, you don't, like Jeremy was saying, without a registration, you don't have full rights, but there are some rights that exist instantly. Okay, so let's talk about within this copyright bucket, because I'm we're going to kind of show how what you guys just described plays out in an impactful way in some specific scenarios and in a later part of this episode. But while we're just sort of in the definitional defining all of these terms period of this, I want to ask, what does CC0 then mean within the context of this broader copyright category? I don't know, Daniel, Jeremy, whoever wants to take that. Yeah, that yeah, that that makes that's a great follow on to, to what we were just talking about because CC zero basically is how you undo the fact that the copyright immediately and instantaneously exists. Um, again, if I, if I come up with an invention, I write it down, but I don't do anything about it, and somebody comes along and has the same invention, and they go out and they publish it and they make millions and millions of dollars, there's nothing that I can do about that if I didn't seek patent protection. Um, but when I put something, when I fix, you know, a work of art in a tangible medium, I write it down, I take a picture of it, whatever. At that point, I immediately have certain rights unless I disclaim them. So with patent and trademark, I can disclaim my rights by simply doing nothing, by just sitting here. I don't use it in commerce. I don't seek registration, etc. But for copyrights, I have to disclaim my rights, even the limited rights that I have absent registration. You, that's really worse. It's the difference between like in. opting out and opting in. Like you have to opt out exactly. of your rights with copyright, it sounds like. Correct. So with the I, other versions, you have to opt in. Other IP, you have to opt in. Copyright, you have to opt out. So then let's talk about if you are somebody who's, for example, running an NFT project and you want to do the in vogue thing of making your project CC0 and, and the art that maybe you personally created or that you got the rights to through some sort of licensing agreement with an artist. Um how do you go ahead and make your project CC0? Jeremy, yeah, do you want to take can, it? Sure, I can address that. Um, it is it is very simple. Uh, it is very easy to waive your rights, um, which is, uh, well, I guess that remains to be untested. Let me start here, which is, this is all untested, all of it. I mean, almost everything we're going to talk about when it comes to NFTs, generative art that's associated with NFTs, creative commons licenses and how they work, how they're enforceable, whether you can change them, how do you do them? They're all, it's all untested. And and what do I mean by that? There hasn't been really any litigation over how any of this works. There have not been courts that weigh in on whether these licenses are enforceable, whether the waivers are enforceable, whether you can, you know, put the genie back in the bottle, whether you can change. There's just been almost nothing, even though these types of licenses, and, I, and when I talk about these types of licenses, what I mean are open source licenses, creative commons licenses, licenses that take a body of work, be it software, be it artwork, be it literature, and it's not an agreement between one person and another at arm's length, but rather a creator or a project or a company that has IP and they publish a license that's supposed to apply generally to an entire community of people and users. There has been very little decision making and court intervention and uh, you know definitive precedent and analysis about how this all works. That all said, according to the Creative Commons license structure, all you're supposed to do is take the work and essentially put a symbol that's a, you know a zero with a circle around it instead of what we have here, which is the C with the circle around it, right? And you put a zero with the C around it. And you link back 
um, to the CC0 license, which is published on the Creative Commons website. And you kind of just announce publicly that I hereby publish this project um, under the uh, under the CC0 license as part of the terms that are associated with the project. And that's kind of supposed to be enough in order to do that. Wow. And so when you say link back to the CC0 license that the Creative Commons published, do you mean in the terms and conditions for your project, for example? Is that where that needs to be linked back to? Or can it be just like on your website? I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't, it's, it's funny because the way that CC0 really contemplated working would have been like, let's say a software, which is, you know, the by far the most juice in this entire area has been in the open source software community. And the idea there would be that when you publish your source code, you could put the CC0 symbol and sort of, you know, just state at the top that this is subject to X license. And CC0 is one of the menu of licenses. There's other ones out there. There's the MIT license, which functions very similarly. There's the AGPL license, which functions very similarly in terms of making these things open source, making them available to the public. With an art project, I, I can imagine a few different ways of implementing that. I think one way has just been you know, publishing a license on a website. It could be making an announcement, but although if the announcement says there are terms coming soon, then I would say that's probably means that you have to wait until the terms come out to see what really is, is binding. Um, but I think there's a few ways to skin the cat there in order to make, uh, to make them, I don't want to say enforceable, but in order to implement the artist's desire to relinquish their copyright interest in the, in the artwork. And I'll just, I just wanted to add because it, yes, we haven't actually done a lot of case law involving NFTs at this point. This issue hasn't been fully vetted all the way through, but I'm going to take the the younger listeners all the way back to my day, back when we had this little thing called Napster, right? And a lot of these issues have been dealt with in emerging technologies in the past. So yeah, you have a CC0 license, uh, CC0, you know, license, I'll put license in air quotes, because really it's a waiver of rights. The ability to waive copyrights has been known for a long time. There's a lot of law out there about it, right? Um, it's an issue that came up in the Napster case. And, and the, the Ninth Circuit has decided this re issue repeatedly. You can, you can waive your copyrights if you acknowledge their existence and you have an a, a, a actual intent by the creator to surrender those rights. And that's all you need. So we have all these fancy things out there, CC0, and where we get to put all this stuff. But at the end of the day, the core concept that we're dealing with here, the ability of a creator to surrender their copyrights, has existed and, and has been litigated in other fields repeatedly. So let's talk about that's if you want to waive your copyrights altogether. But we also see in the cases of like a board apes or what Moonbirds had maybe originally, which is the idea of transferring a copyright in some capacity. Can you speak to the different models for that and also like can a can a copyright be just fully transferred or are we only seeing what we all recently learned about, I think, because of the Moonbirds case, which is that like you're granted a particular license that gives you the right to use this copyright, but you don't have full control over it. So let's let's start with the first one. Can you transfer all of all of your copyrights to somebody else? The answer is clearly yes. It happens all the time. People sign agreements all the time. If, For example, if you get married, right? and you pay your wedding photographer a substantial sum of money, you'll get back in return uh, an assignment of all the copyright. Now, you'll also come across photographers like that where you pay a substantially lower amount of money and all you get is a license to the photographs and they own the copyright. But again, this happens all the time. This is not new to NFTs. You can absolutely assign away all or some portion of, because like Jeremy was saying, it's like a bundle of sticks. I can break off little pieces but I can do all, none, or anywhere in between um, in terms of assigning away my copyrights. So yes, that is absolutely something you could do. And Carly, what was the other part of your question? I, I well, so then, well, this will get us into the, let's start talking about some specific cases we're starting to see here. So the, the question here is, broadly speaking, or maybe with some of these big projects like Board Ape Yacht Club, are we seeing projects actually sign away all of the copyright rights? Or what we're seeing them do is give the holders a license that says that that individual holder can, uh, you know, ha has like commercial rights over the copyright, but they don't actually own it entirely themselves. Yeah. So 
what one just before we get to the specific application uh, I think it's helpful to clarify a little bit about what it means to you know transfer a copyright versus those individual sticks that you know Daniel was just referring to um, one is the 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 idea is that um, in order to assign the entire copyright to transfer the entire copyright one of the challenges or potential challenges and the remaster folks could would be probably good good people to talk about this is that in order to transfer an entire copyright the copyright act has a rule that requires the author to sign an instrument agreeing to the transfer itself and so how that works in conjunction with blockchain transactions is a very interesting question. I don't know that, it, you know, that's just, I'll just raise that as an, a question, right? It's not, you're not gonna have the artist signing a piece of paper necessarily, but you are gonna have tokens that are associated with certain rights being transferred and mediated by smart contracts on the blockchain. How do those two requirements work together? The writing requirement of the Copyright Act and the transfer requirements of, uh, of, the, of the Copyright Act. So um, that's that's one. Two, I would say the way that these licenses could work, in theory, you could have a situation where the artist or the author of these of these of these works is transferring the copyright as a whole so that they no longer have any interest in it whatsoever. But if you have a situation where an artist says, I give you the right to use my artwork, but it's subject to certain strings, right? There's certain restrictions, there's certain strings attached. Whether they call it a license or they call it a transfer, and Daniel, you'll, you tell me if you agree with this, that's a license. If the artist is continuing to hold on to certain rights, it's probably in the nature of a license, not in the nature of a transfer. Now, when you say I'm giving somebody the rights to do something with that piece of art, there's really lots of ways to skin that cat. The most important of which, one of the most important of which is, is that a non-exclusive right or is that an exclusive right? Right, which that means is non-exclusive would mean, yeah, I'm granting you the rights to do that, but I'm also keeping the rights to do that. And I reserve the right to grant to lots of other people the right to make uses of that artwork. And a non-exclusive licensee, somebody who gets the right to use something, but not the only person, they don't have a monopoly on it, that person has very limited rights of enforcement. In fact, under the Copyright Act, that person cannot sue someone else for using the copyright, even if they think they're doing it without permission. Only the copyright owner can do that. Now contrast that with a license where it's an exclusive license and says only you can use this, then that person has the monopoly and they do have the right to sue other people. So whether it's the transfer of copyright, not exclusive license, exclusive license is really important. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that we are seeing primarily non-exclusive licenses here in this space. And again, to use sort of the seminal example, because they were the first, quote unquote, to like give these IP rights to their holders, Board Ape Yacht Club, that would be a non-exclusive license, correct? Daniel? I'm, I'm, I'm opting out of answering this <laughs> I know. One, Jer Jeremy's folks. recusing himself, so I'll, I'll throw it to you, Daniel. I recuse. Daniel, you can so, take that one. Or yeah. Max, whoever. It's, it's a good question because, right, the Board Ape Yacht Club said that they, they sold all their all their rights and you were the exclusive owner. But when you actually read the terms on their website, the terms read as a license uh, because it says so long as you are in com you know compliance with these terms. Keep in mind, when I sell, if I give my rights away, if I sell my rights to somebody, whether it's intellectual property or tangible property, um, they're gone. That's it, right? I give if I sell you my car, I don't get to come back later on and say, "Hey, um, I don't, Carly, you're not using my car the right way. It's your property." Um, there's something called Dreet Morale, which is you know moral rights. Which again, if you sell away all of your, if you give away all your rights in a copyright, you give everything away. So the idea that the terms of Board Ape Yacht Club have this provision in there that you know so long as you are uh, subject to your, it's, it's subject to your continued compliance with these terms. Well, wait a second then. Did you did did I 
get all of the rights or why is it suddenly subject so, so, so to what you're what you're saying here is board apes uh, the, the the you know the team has sort of spoken about this like you have these full rights but when you actually read the contract we have the language here it says commercial use subject to your continued compliance with these terms yuga labs grants you an unlimited worldwide license to use copy and display the purchased art for the purpose of creating derivative works based upon the art so that line subject to your continued compliance would suggest this is not like a complete complete you have them forever and always kind of a rights. And and this will get us to then the something we'll get to later, which is the the other enforceability challenges here, which is also how do these rights transfer from one seller to another, you know, a, as you go down the chain of of people who buy apes and and then sell them to to other people. Cause it sounds like there's some complications around all of that as well. Without sort of spilling it now, is, is that right? That it gets a little dicey? It can. And just to make it, it, let's let's make it even more confusing. (laughs) Let's make it even more confusing here for a moment, right? Um, Those board terms and conditions, the part that you just read, Carly, when you go two paragraphs up, it starts off with, you own the NFT. Okay, so now I've got a document that um, it, it starts off by saying, I own it. And then two paragraphs later says, subject to my continued compliance. I'm not sure what exactly that is supposed to be. It it, it has language that is that is it, it is uh, suggestive of both a full assignment and a license. And can I should I, say this I, is I, I, yeah. Go go. Well, I was just going to caveat and say this is not meant as like some sort of full throttle attack on on Yuga Labs. Like I think we can all understand this project launched a, a year ago in a ver- in this space that was like wide open. I'm sure they did not anticipate. I can't. We can't see what you're showing, Max, but he's showing something there. A hat. Just my afforded, hat. My your my basey hat. hat yeah, yeah. Support. You know. This was in, you know, early days, you know, early territory. This is not to say that Yuga is is uh, trying to be nefarious or or bad here. Just these are complicated issues that we're now dealing with in real time as this space has grown well beyond anybody well, expected. And, and to their credit, I mean, they totally disrupted the norm, right? The norm before Yuga was creator crypto punks keeps everything, right? And so, you know, with disruption uh, comes reverberations, right? And, and people usually don't get it right the first time. And they, they took a giant leap, in my opinion, at least, uh, for the entire NFT community and the creative community to reverse what uh, copyright and rights uh, imbued to uh, an owner of your work have uh, versus centuries of uh, art law. So. Mm-hmm. But the license is kind of bad. So let's keep talking about it, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, 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 here's, let's, I, I really want to clarify something that's that's so core and fundamental that we haven't we haven't done, and and it's it's really 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 important, and that's distinguishing between what a non fungible token is and what a piece of art is, and these are different things. And part of the confusion with that language that Daniel was talking about is that it is true that you own the non fungible token. That is sort of undebatable because how do I know that you own it? Because Yuga Labs, once they release that into the wild, they can't control or freeze or seize or do anything. It is out of their hands. You own it. It gets stolen. They cannot get that NFT back any more than anyone else unless you have the seed phrase associated with the wallet that is recorded on the blockchain as owning that thing. Only the owner of that seed phrase, Only that is the only person that can control it. So that is like... You know, when you sometimes you say possession is nine tenths of the law, it's something we say <laughs> when it comes to a non fungible token, possession is 10 tenths of the law. There is no, you know, you can have a court ordering someone to send back an NFT till you're blue in the face. They cannot do it unless you have that seed phrase. But what's different is that in a non fungible token, what makes it non fungible is that it has an association through the records on the, in the smart contract. It says this. Token number, you know, 4156 is associated, right, with this particular piece of art, okay? that it's, It has a link to it. It's not even a hyperlink. It's like it could be a hashtag value. It could be a URI to a file that's sitting on IPFS. And there's the piece of art. That is different than the non-fungible token itself. I know I'm stating very obvious things to people who understand it, but when we get in these, these discussions about licenses, about ownership, about what you get, it is so critical to understand that it's in, it is absolutely indisputable that you do own the non-fungible token that's associated 
with your ape, and maybe that's kind of what it's saying. But what are your rights with respect to that artwork? Well, that might be a feature of the language in a license agreement or in the terms. And so it's it's just really important that and how whether those things are separable and whether you can decouple them, these are all could really interesting questions mm-hmm. that may depend on the license and, and how that all plays out. I appreciate that that clarification. And I, I want to take us to something we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is, um, you know, d- defending your copyright or defending your trademark and and the fact that a copyright is conferred to you automatically uh, upon the creation of a work, for example, and, and you don't have to opt into that. In fact, you have to opt out of that. One of the things we've heard from the proof team uh, on a couple of occasions is like the the legal expense of having to defend you know, that this copyright and that that being part of the reason that they decided to make it CC0 is that it takes that legal burden off of them. And I think there's some confusion around this question, and I've seen some debates on it on Twitter, which is you're not actually legally obligated to go after every copyright violator, or not legally obligated, I should phrase it like this. If you don't go after a copyright violator, that doesn't put you in a position to lose your copyright, correct? But that that can be a situation in a trademark case where if you don't go after trademark violators, you could actually lose your trademark. Can you provide some clarity on, on that particular situation? Yeah, so trademark, unlike other types of intellectual property, trademark law requires enforcement. You have to protect your brand. Um, if you don't protect your brand, you potentially lose your brand because of imitators out there. And it, it, it winds up doing what's called diluting your brand. So suddenly my trademark is no longer a source identifier of, of my goods or services is the technical language for it. Um, you do not necessarily have to be as vigilant with copyright because copyrights, again, being different than trademarks and service marks, um, they, they exist on their own. The work of art is the work of art. If somebody makes a copy, well, I was going to say a copy of the Mona Lisa, but the trademark, the copyrights in the Mona Lisa are long gone. But um, you know, let's take let's take modern modern properties, right? So if somebody creates a, uh, a fan art of Captain America, for example, uh, Disney or Marvel, whoever owns the copyright to Captain America at this point in time doesn't lose their copyright because they allow the fan art or the fan fiction to continue to exist. It's actually a very large part of the value of those properties is the community. And you don't see the big AAA brand owners going out there with a club and whacking everybody who who creates a drawing of one of the characters. And they know where to find them because they're online, they're on forums. It's very easy to, to engage in that kind of activity, but they choose not to because there's more value to the, the AAA brand owners and allowing some of that activity to occur. And they can do so without running the risk of losing their copyrights overall. It's actually a an art to this, and it's something uh, that's talked about a lot. In fact, at the International Trademark Association's conference, I think it was about five or six years ago, they had the uh, the general counsel of DC Comics uh, as the keynote speaker talking about this very subject. So it is not something that you have to constantly uh, take out every single infringer. And in fact, there are some business cases to allowing limited uh, limited what would technically be infringing uses because there is value add to the project. Yeah, so that's Daniel's spot on about the the law on this. Um, I think it's a good time though. With you know, I think your question cues up uh, something that's really important in my mind to understand about the value proposition of non fungible tokens and the art and the content and the media that's associated with these non fungible token projects. I've I've talked about um, I sort of have I don't know I call it a thesis where I talk I I can I call non fungible tokens the three layer copyright cake, okay and I think this is a really good way to understand a little bit about what's going on here with the decisions between doing things like CC zero granting owners rights or something like where the owners or the creators keep all the rights themselves or they give it to a DAO I believe that these are all different ways of playing with what I call the three layer copyright cake here's what I mean by that. Default rules of copyright under the Copyright Act, they recognize two layers, like the old school way of doing things, two layers of a copyright. There's the there's the material object, right? And then there's the intellectual property rights in the material object. Okay, what do I mean by that? You're a painter, you make a painting, and then you go and you sell the, the, the physical painting in the, in the marketplace. 
the owner, the, the person who bought the collector that bought that physical work of art, they own that physical piece. They own the material object. The, the, the artist cannot assert rights over that material object. It's theirs to sell. There's something called the first sale doctrine. They can go and resell it, no problem. But the artist retains all of those bundle of stick rights. That owner of the physical piece cannot go out and um, license that artwork for use in a commercial, right? Just as much as if you buy a copy of Dune, you cannot take that book Dune and then make a commercial use of it because you own the physical book, even if it's an old book of Dune, you do not get any of those rights, right? So material object versus IP and the material object. One of the reasons that non-fungible tokens in my mind are revolutionary and different from what was before is because we've added a new layer to that three layer copyright cake. We've added a token layer that did not exist before. And what does that token layer do? It ascribes ownership of the work that's different than the material object. It's different from the intellectual property. It's just a token that ascribes ownership that is associated. That's the official record of who owns the work, but it ain't the material object. I mean, these are all digital and I know that I have an MFR and I never got any material object of my MFR. And I know I didn't get any IP rights because that's a CC0 project. So what in the world did I get when people were offering me five ETH for my MFR? They, were, they wanted the token rights. It's a third layer of that, of that copyright cake. And a lot of what's going on here is about where is the value gonna come from these NFTs? Is it gonna come from the intellectual property exploitation of the artwork under like a traditional model, which deals with sort of exclusivity and licensing and giving some people permission and not others? Is it gonna come from that token layer where it's like, you know what, the more that this piece of art is out there in the world, the more that it's memified, the more that it's like a cultural significance, that's gonna raise the value. Is it something in between or is it something else? And so to me, it's, I think one of the decisions that's made by Moonbirds is like weighing sort of, where, where do we fit in that value proposition? Do we wanna be more like this category of IP or are we more like this other one that's dealing more with tokens and more about this sort of being out there in the world? And so it's a different, it's not just a different worldview, it's a different way of thinking about where are we going to get the value from these non-fungible tokens. Yeah, I think I think it's a great point. I mean, fundamentally, you know, these things should should be have like collectible and cultural significance and all these projects are just taking different approaches to how to create that cultural significance, but it is that token layer that should cultural significance be reached should should accrue in value in the way that a collectible of, of a Marvel character does, I think is, is the point you're making, which is uh, spot on and a, and a good reminder. Um, but you, you just, if I can I cut real quick, Carly, just sure. keep in mind in a CC zero situation, you do limit the ability to, you know, where that value can be created because there are no, you've given away all the copyrights in the underlying artwork or whatever it is you're displaying, you know, and, and that can be, it's, it, it, look at it this way, right? That's akin to when something goes, comes into the public domain off of copyright. We just saw Winnie the Pooh, the A. A. Milne, not the Disney version, but the original book come into the public domain because it's been long enough now that it's public domain. And one of the first things somebody did was create a movie called Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And yeah. there's nothing that anybody can do to stop that. That's just, you're now going yeah, to have then, a, a slasher flick with Winnie the Pooh and, and Piglet murdering people. But how many great Sherlock Holmes, uh, you know, series do we have? Right? Well, let's and not get it. Let's not get it all. <laughs> if you want to get really but complicated, that is, that let's is the talk counter about argument, that. Argument, though. <laughs> that is the, that is the, the bet that the CC0 folks are making is that actually like you, what you're gaining is the ability for anybody to now come and, and, and create value out of your CC0 work and, and definitely trade offs on both sides. And hey, look, we're all talking about yep. Winnie the Pooh now, you know, and Winnie the Pooh has not made Disney money for a long time. And now now maybe, you know, they'll they'll be able to sell some more merch because it's in the in the public conversation. That's the bet, at least. But I fully understand your point as well yeah um you, you, There's, you know we're going back and forth about all of these different ways to use your assets but the way that you can use your assets is very limited based on the logic that's defined in these standard you know erc 721 protocols and all of the definitions of how people can use these assets are written in legal text whether it's cc0 whether it's you know various types of different cop copyright whether it's more nuanced the issue is that there's been no way to actively have a nuanced approach to interact with community members, to allow them to have certain permissions over some things, no permissions over other things. And 
it's caused chaos. And it's why, you know, where the space started was, if you do anything with these assets, I will sue you. Well, that's relatively simple because it's very restrictive and you have a lot of enforceability. Yes, you limit the utility, but you still have some enforceability. The counterpoint to that is we want to empower the community, give away all of this utility, but now we're limiting a lot of our enforceability. And what I mean by that is you you know, do whatever you want with these assets. We're never going to sue you. And it's a function of not having necessary infrastructure to actually tie the legal system to this Web3 environment. Because it goes back to what Jeremy was saying, which is, you know, yes, there's this copyright layer cake, but what actually is an NFT? It's it's a record of ownership on the blockchain, you know, of a specific token. But what is that actually, what is that token actually associated to? It's associated to various images, various rights, but where are all of these constituent components of that NFT actually held? A lot of them are held in centralized, you know, IPFS is decentralized storage, but a lot of them are, you know, also held uh, on AWS or all of these other components. And where it becomes more complex is when you have an asset that exists on the blockchain, and then you have definitions of how you want people to utilize that asset. But there's no communication layer to influence how people can interact with that asset. You're left with, you know, I mean, what exactly is going on in the space right now, which is we're just going to continue to test things out and see who gets sued. And then eventually precedent will be set. And then we'll start building projects based on the precedent that is already set, as opposed to just having infrastructure that supports the intended use from the get go that can still evolve over time. Immutable X is the layer two platform for crypto gaming. Immutable offers massive scalability with up to 9,000 transactions per second and instant transaction confirmation. No more gas fees, no more waiting around for your transaction to clear. Immutable's zero knowledge roll up finally unlocks the world of crypto gaming. Immutable X is the only gas free NFT minting platform with over 26 million NFTs minted, all with zero gas fees. With the power of Immutable, gaming developers don't also need to become smart contract developers, they just need to plug in to Immutable's API and instantly start unlocking the full potential of crypto assets inside of games. This is why world-class companies and projects have decided to deploy on Immutable X like GameStop, Ember Sword, Planet Quest, Illuvium, TikTok, and many more behind the scenes. So start building your game on Immutable X today at immutable.com. MetaMask is the leading Web3 wallet to get you access to everything you need in Web3. If you're just getting started on your NFT journey, you need MetaMask. And if you need to fund your MetaMask account in order to buy that NFT that you've been eyeing, well, now you can do that directly through MetaMask. Just click the blue buy button on the home screen. Personally, I'm mad that I've spent extra gas fees transferring money from Coinbase to MetaMask in order to buy NFTs. I've been using MetaMask directly and it is so much better. You can also buy stable coins and native tokens from Ethereum, Polygon, on Avalanche, CeeLo, and others. And you can do it directly with your debit card, your credit card, through Apple Pay or Google Pay. And there is now an improved buying experience on MetaMask Mobile. You'll only see tokens that are in your region, so it's personalized to you, and you'll get real-time quotes, so you know you're always getting the best deal. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask yet, what are you waiting for? Go try it out. You can learn more about buying cryptocurrencies with MetaMask at metamask.io slash buy dash crypto. So let's get into some of that in that enforceability last category of what we'll talk about here in, in a few minutes, because I think it's, no, I can't, it is I a, can't hold off. I know you, <laughs> you, you, Max has very strong feelings about this and it's, it's great because it's bringing an important issue to light. Um, I, I, again, talking in some of these specific terms now. So there's a lawsuit right now, uh, between Yuga Labs and Ryder Rips, who has been saying all sorts of things publicly about Yuga Labs and then actually copied the entire Board Ape collection to create this Board Ape. Yacht Club RR version of the collection, et cetera, et cetera. Yuga is suing Ry uh, Ryder and Co. over use of their trademark, which is, again, an important distinction. So over use of the Board Ape Yacht Club name and their logo and, and, and those kinds of marks, not actually for infringing on the copyright of the Ape collection. And I would imagine there's a couple of reasons they're, do they're doing this, but first and foremost is because they have said these individual apes are owned by individual people and you have the rights to them. As we're unpacking what all this means, it, it, could could Yuga Labs sue Ryder Rips over the individual pieces of artwork themselves based on the current license? Yes. 
Very interesting. But of course, the well, holders themselves <laughs> also can sue Ryder Rips over the individual collections because they also have rights over that collection. Yeah, that's where it gets really complicated, right? Um, and again, not to not to not to harp on their on their uh, terms and conditions too much, but this is also a great ad for why you need to have an attorney help you through these things. You know, Jeremy mentioned a little while ago. You know, there's a difference between the NFT and the artwork itself. And that, absolutely, I agree with that. The problem is some of the language in these terms and conditions reads: when you purchase an NFT, you own the underlying board ape, comma the art, capital A, comma completely. Period. What does that mean? Right? It sounds like I own. It sounds like I own the entire thing. Um, I, I don't know because it's not clear in the document. So, um, look, when you, Car, your your question, Carly, about is you know who can you know can you bring a lawsuit? The answer is well, as long as you can have a colorable claim and the whatever it is three hundred dollars or three hundred fifty dollars to file a lawsuit, you can file a lawsuit. Um, what's the answer? Uh, that's to be well, seen. I, I think this goes back though, right, Carly, to who, if you filed copyright, if you did not file copyright, to my understanding, and, and and please correct me if I'm mistaken, I don't believe Board Ape has filed copyright for the individual apes. I know they've filed trademark for the brand and uh, logos and, and terms and phrases that we, we've talked about earlier. Um, and so th there's an interesting issue of how, how do you acquire copyright and who could acquire copyright? The apes were minted uh, based on an algorithm uh, with no, uh, th there was creativity associated with the creation of the algorithm and the traits associated with it. But the actual generation of the artwork itself was purely without any human interference or action. And so there is this issue, uh, is generative artwork classified within the human purview to receive copyright protection. And Property Law 101 says, I can only sell you what I have. So there, it begs the question, Is did Yuga have copyright in the artwork to then transfer to the underlying uh, board ape owners? Um, and uh, versus what the lawsuit is focused on is on the use of the trademark logo, the use of the board ape name, B-A-Y-C, uh, et cetera. So I'll, I'll do you one better, Alex. D just one quickly. Um, imagine, let's just assume, for example, that Board Ape or not, not even Board Ape, like any one of these projects actually did have copyright and they were actually able to impart copyright to these, you know, actual NFT purchasers. And someone started a business, started working through a lot of these things. They realized someone actually infringed upon their copyright and they went through a lawsuit process. What happens when those terms are actually changed? as a lot of the initial terms and conditions have certain clauses that say, you know, with respect to our own yada, 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 like we have, we retain the right well, to actually change these did. terms. We, we reserve the right to amend. Uh, I'll, I'll let you jump in here, Carly, because I know you, 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 it appears well, to be I, I was, was, was going to say, I just wanted to get clear on this for people, right? Because um, the, the, you're raising this generative art question, which is another really interesting big rabbit hole we could go down. And, and that feels like something that is, you know, uh, a dark shadow maybe over the entire industry. But let's assume that, <laughs> that yeah, that, that generative art and, and that, you know, Yuga Labs did have the copyright for this initially because they contracted out to artists and then they, and in that contract, they said they get all the IP. And so they, they have that copyright. You've raised the second question of, did they file for copyright? And I think this is where folks might start getting really confused because they're like, well, I thought copyright, I, I know you said at the beginning here, Jeremy, like, well, you can get additional rights if you file for copyright. But the understanding is that at the creation of this unique creative work, that copyright existed for them to to enforce, and then they gave the rights to individuals to enforce that as well. So, are you saying now that they would have had to additionally file for copyright in order to so, sue Ryder over these individual pieces? I'll, yeah. So let me let me just say a, a, a few things. One, put put all this aside. It is just absolute black letter, not black letter, Supreme Court law. They actually came out with a decision called the Fourth Estate Decision. It came out a couple of years ago. That was just super clear. In order to file a lawsuit for copyright infringement, you need to have obtained a copyright registration from the Copyright Office or a denial of a copyright registration from the Copyright Office before you can file a lawsuit. So that is 
just super clear. So even though you wait, own wait, wait. it to let, let, yeah. let me cut in here because does that mean then that individual holders, if they wanted to sue over copyright infringement of the ape that they hold, they would need to be filing for a copyright? So again, let's use the right language because it has to be specific. You don't file for a copyright. You file for a copyright registration. Okay. Right? So it's the copyright you own. That no one can take that away from you as the but author. But to sue, you need a copyright registration? In, in order to sue, you need a copyright registration. And so if, by the way, just let, let me just, let me just, I promise I'm going to answer this. If let's say that Yuga Labs, let's assume, you, let, let's say Yuga Labs owns the copyright. Okay. That means that they can file for the copyright registration. And if you, if you are an exclusive licensee of somebody's copyright, an exclusive licensee, you also have the right to file for copyright registration, but you would list Yuga Labs as the copyright owner and you would list yourself as an exclusive licensee. And then you as the exclusive licensee would have the ability to sue for a copyright infringement. I, I do have more to say, but I want to stop there and see. Okay. If you yes. So let me, let me pause. So, okay. So already we've identified there's a challenge, which is it's like not entirely clear if you're the exclusive licensee as a, as an ape holder, for example. Now, additionally, you're saying in order to sue, you would need to get a copyright registration. So if Jimmy wants to sue Ryder specifically, because Ryder's using Jimmy's ape specifically, Jimmy would need to get a, a copyright registration for his ape, which knowing Jimmy, or, like, Lord or knows probably I, I said an or, I said an or, or, if or a denial, if the copyright office says for whatever reason we're not going to give you a copyright registration, that's also enough to go to court and say I own this copyright. I should have gotten a copyright but, registration. I can say okay, okay, cool. But the the key piece there being there's work that he needs to do, labor that he, he needs to do on his end before he can file a lawsuit. So then this gets to if I file a copyright registration so that I can sue Ryder for using my ape, you know, whatever in a derivative work. How does it work if I want to sell this ape? Like if I now as an individual own that copyright registration, does that transfer with the ape to the next person who buys it and then wants to sue somebody for it? Or do they have to re-register and my head's going to explode? De depends on the terms of the sale. It's, Welcome to yeah. the disconnect of hyper liquidity and reactive litigation. Yeah. So yeah, look, there's, what what you're talking about here are dual registration systems. So at the copyright office, the copyright office has its own registry, right? And it doesn't really tap in. There's no API between the uh, copyright office registration system and the uh, Ethereum blockchain. They haven't built that technology quite yet. So remaster really? if you want if you want the next project. Um, quite they yes, haven't linked those two. Yeah, weird. I don't even know so, if they. Uh, that's you know, very so optimistic, that. Jeremy. When, when one when one exclusive license when one when when an exclusive license passes from party A to party B, in theory, there's the copyright office has a system where you record a, a statement of transfer with the copyright office, and so if the license were to transfer from one party to the next, like in theory, there's a a system to be able to do that. I, I need well, to, I need to say something. Back which, to yeah, go ahead, Title go ahead. Seventeen that requires it to be in writing, just. Well, the, tra the, the transfer of uh, an exclusive license or uh, of the an assignment oh, of copyright is being Okay, we're, we're going to go where Max wants us to go after this one final sort of quite specific question. And where Max wants us to go is going to get into all of this. Because again, this is now this broader, very murky area that we're getting into around all of this. The, the last very specific question I have for y'all is this tweet, which I have pasted in our chat here, but I'm going to read it out. It's from the, the Crypto Funks. Uh, you know, Twitter or uh, CryptoFunks project, which is in and of itself obviously controversial in all number of ways related to things we're talking about. But they had this tweet and they said, IP rights granted from purchasing or minting an NFT are 100% fake. CryptoFunks are verified on OpenSea. Why do you think the DMCA didn't work? And this is in reference to the fact that Larva Labs had previously, DMCA was like the, the term for, they tried to get CryptoFunks delisted from OpenSea, claiming it was infringing on their, their copyright. So CryptoFunks is saying Larva Labs failed to get us delisted from OpenSea, and that's because they don't actually own these IP rights. And then the tweet goes on. Larva Labs and Yuga Labs themselves don't own the rights to the 10K individual images. How could they possibly transfer them to you? This strikes me as just wrong on like a number of levels because they did at least originally have the IP rights. I think it's saying rights. two things. It's also saying two things that Break are this uh, kind down of, uh, for, against for each other. Us And tell me if this makes any sense to y'all and if this is correct in any way yeah that, yes i i, I do, want, do want to answer this i think i can answer this 
Uh, but I, I really need to say, I feel like a politician going back to a point here, but I do need to go back to a point, Carly. And here's the point. There's an idea that judges have, and for some reason I have this analogy first called judicial restraint, which is when you're making a decision, what a judge will often do is find the path of least resistance and say, what is the easiest way? What is the narrowest decision I can make in order to accomplish the decision I need to make and to make this determination? If so, the Supreme Court, for example, if the Supreme Court can avoid having to get into thorny issues of constitutional interpretation, and there's a much easier way to dispose of a case, they're going to do that. And by the way, that same principle of finding the narrowest path of least resistance is a mantra of effective litigators, okay, of which I am one, a proud one. And often I will choose causes of action, not based on whether they have merit and not based on whether I have rights and not based on anything. It's just What's the laser beam where this person has no good defense, okay? And so just because, you know, a party has a copyright claim doesn't mean that they necessarily want to assert it if they have a slam dunk trademark claim, right? So I just want to make that clear that just because somebody didn't assert a right is not any kind of acknowledgement, admission that they don't have the right, that they don't think they could win. It just means, well, if I have a slam dunk way to get rid of this thing where the other person has no good defense, in my opinion, I might go that route. Well, and that's question. where yeah. undeniably Ryder Rips fails, right? Like the use of the logo, the use of the name, the use of the brand, and the use of the phrase are clear, unequivocal trademark infringements and clear violations of the trademark filings by Yuga. You could get into the semantics of the gener generative work otherwise, but I mean, the laser beam has been shot. Um, I, I don't know how it survives. To answer this question, they're dealing with a lot that the crypto funks issue is, is mashing together a bunch of different concepts. One is the idea that the DMCA is any arbiter of rights is a complete fallacy. OK, DMCA stands for the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And what we're dealing with here is Alex has very rightly talked about Title 17. And what we're talking about in Title 17 is Section 512 of Title 17. That's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And that is what sets forth the very famous notice and takedown procedure that governs copyright on the internet. And the way that procedure works is somebody says, if somebody puts something up online that they think is infringing, the copyright owner, a person that claims of the copyright owner comes forward and says, um, hey, service provider that's hosting this thing, I, that's my copyright. I want you to take that down. The service provider then goes back to the poster and says, hey, poster, I just received this notice. What do you think? And that poster has the right to put in a counter notification and say, disagree. It's fair use. They don't own the rights. I disagree with it. And then it goes back. The burden then shifts back to the original person that sent the notice to either file a lawsuit, right? Or the service provider has the right to put it back online. So what you're saying is like, but, in this case, it, it, it could be a scenario where Larva Labs was basically like, we're not going to, this isn't worth us going to court over. So we're not going to file exactly. that response, which allows it to go back onto OpenSea, even if Larva Labs had a, and, a, a proper original claim. And all that, all that means is that, that the Larva Labs or, or, you know, at that point, Larva Labs wouldn't have a claim against OpenSea for secondary copyright liability. This isn't about this, this whole thing is this is, that's why this is, this is one of the 10 reasons that this post is misguided. And one of those reasons is this is about OpenSea's liability as a platform, as an intermediary, mm. as, a, as a place. It's like, cause they don't wanna be liable for infringing Larva Labs copyright. We're just a platform. But as long as they follow the safe harbor, the procedures of the DMCA, they're in the clear. And so if Larva Labs decided not to sue, then like that's all that means. Okay, yeah, so put, that's well, part let's put one. Some specifics. I was just want, let's put some specifics on it. There are reasons why you wouldn't follow through on the DMCA procedure. If you're going to file the lawsuit, you have to file it in the district where the, the, the platform is located. You might not want to sue them there. You might say, you know what? I'll let it go back up. And I'm going to sue the infringer in a different location where I, I, it's closer to my home, it's closer to my office, it's closer to my client, I like the rules better. Any number of reasons why you might make that strategic well, decision. Or you pull it into federal court for interstate commerce, but that's 
Pathetic. Well, no, it's always okay. it's always in federal court. For, or you for, just sell your rights to of, the labs. Right. <laughs> for, for the sake of uh, time limits, I'm going to move us on from just that and just say part, part two of this answer is it also doesn't seem correct that Larva and Yuga themselves don't or didn't ever own the right to the 10K individual images. Clearly, that's not true with a couple of asterisks, which is that we don't actually know what the contract looked like between Yuga Labs and the artist they contracted. So, you know, if that was weird, sloppy language, there's a chance. But assuming all of that is buttoned up, that part of this tweet is like patently untrue as well. Well, the, yeah. the, I think the tweet's trying to get out. Maybe um, I'm reading two in between the lines here, but it could be begging the question, is generative art subject right. to copyright? That right, strikes me as that's way that's more big. advanced than this tweet is trying to get at. I think you're giving them way too much credit. <laughs> uh, right, I, I, I'm not trying to give them credit. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. You could also say with the name as Crypto Funks, it could be subject uh, to parody. Uh, as uh, Oh, well, that's what they claim. Uh, this is a, you know, they're very, yeah. they, they this is a whole long di dispute between Larva and Crypto Funks. And Crypto Funks is very openly saying we're satirical, we're parody, etc. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that they owned this art originally and therefore have the rights to to confer the images to you or transfer the images to you. Okay. Final I, part look, of this. Look, could, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Carly. Well, I was just going to move us on in the last 10 minutes here and and talk about these enforceability broader what? enforceability challenges that we've really been talking about throughout this episode. <laughs> Jeremy, you want to try and I, I, I wanted to I wanted to just talk about generative art generally, generative art generally for a moment in terms of IP ownership, because this is a critical question that, by the way, has little to nothing to do with non-fungible tokens and nothing to do with blockchain. It has to do with digital art. It has to do with the use of computers and um, and and artificial intelligence potentially, and where the line is in terms of a human gaining copyright ownership over a work that uses a computer. And this is a debate and an issue that has been going on since the 1960s, at, at, at least, okay? And I'm going to refer, there was, Alex was uh, talking about this earlier today. There was just a decision by the Copyright Review Board at the Copyright Office that said that a piece of art that was generated pretty much entirely by a computer without human intervention, the Copyright Office said, you know what, we're not going to give a copyright to, to uh, we're not going to give a copyright registration to that piece of art. So um, this is a, a fascinating topic. And I, I want us to I want to bring you guys back on to go down this rabbit I, hole, because the thing that f it feels like the human wrote the code, and that's the part of the craft of generative art, well, if you're talking about like an art block scenario, yes. for example, is is the writing of that code. Maybe. Maybe. Well, but the, fun, the funny thing is the human's going to have a copyright in the code, but right now they don't then have a right copyright in what's output. created by the code. In the output, in the output. But here's, here's what it, th that review board decision quoted a uh, quoted a, a publication from the 1960s um, that when they were deciding how to deal with this issue back in the 1960s, and I still think that that's the right test, okay? And the test is, are you using the computer as a tool? Like who's doing the work? Is the computer doing the creative work or, or is a human using the computer as a tool to create the work? There's no, seems to be no question that if I'm a digital artist and I'm using Adobe, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, and I'm using that very complex piece of computer software, that I'm going to own the ultimate output of my work, even though I'm using this very sophisticated piece of technology, no way Adobe is going to be able to claim that they own the output, right? But there's a line between that situation and a situation like they have, I think, at the Copyright Office now, that's now, by the way, in federal court, they filed a lawsuit about that, which is... The computer's kind of doing all the work and there's not much input from the human. And so with generative art, I think that when the raw materials are created by humans, the elements, the traits, the base layers, and there's real human creativity, and all they're using is a piece of software to do some selection and arrangement, I think that's more like Adobe Photoshop. I think that all the creative juice, all the creative juice of of apes, punks, a lot of these projects is coming from human beings. And the fact that they're using uh, a, a, an algorithm that does some selection and arrangement, maybe maybe selection arrangement is something that could be debated, but to me, all that is is just Adobe Photoshop in, in a different form. Yeah, I mean, at what point, if I, have, if I run an algorithm that says, okay, I drew my basic outline, and now my algorithm is going to select the background, the type of eyes, whether it has an earring, just some basic things. And I've drawn all those options, right? Let's say I've drawn the eight different types of eyes and I go, computer, 
throw, you know, roll the dice and throw one of the eyes that I drew on this on this piece of art. How, you know, it, that does seem to be quantifiably different from me having just written a computer program that says create everything from scratch. Of course, we want to make things even more confusing. You know, when Adobe Photoshop has AI-based tools, when I go, oh, erase this person in the background of my photo, that's using some level of AI and computer input. So now I'm going to create real mess well, here for all of us, but we'll, that's a different we'll, panel. <laughs> we'll do a whole episode on this because, I, you know, the the my emotional response is to want to defend, you know, Tyler Hobbs <laughs> in this conversation as, as much as I can. But I, I recognize uh, this is a, a longer discussion for, for a different time. Uh, this I want to just close with these broader enforceability concerns that Max has been raising throughout this episode and has, has raised previously. And I want to put forward to you a quote that I heard recently, uh, a guy named Josh Kramer, who's setting up a pro protocol called Bcopy, who said, buying an NFT is like buying a piece of paper with the address of the MoMA on it. It doesn't mean you own the art at the MoMA. I might be quite slightly misquoting him, but that's the, the general concept. And he's, of course, referring to the fact that when you buy an NFT, you're buying a smart contract that in 90 whatever percent of cases points to a piece of art that is probably hosted on IPFS or, you know, you know, hopefully AWS, <laughs> hopefully IPFS and hopefully pinned by Arweave, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that the actual art itself is not in the smart contract and is not on the blockchain. I would love to get your reaction to that as it pertains to just all of these kind of open questions about um, what you really are own, what you can transfer, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you know, this is one of those areas where people think that we've we've created this. And again, I'm not saying the technology isn't amazing, but like somehow we've just gone completely off the reservation here. People own artwork that they have stored in a different physical location all the time. It's called free ports. I mean, there's any number of movies that have involved. We're going to break into the safe where oh, the art is kept. This is different, though, right? Because it, if you're saying what you uh, purchased was the smart contract and it points to something, and the I, legal I, the I, legal tie between that is not in the smart contract anywhere. Well, if I buy it, well, it could be if I buy a contract that says, hey, I'm transferring to you ownership of this item just because I don't take physical possession of the item doesn't mean I don't own it. We do that all the time in all sorts of other both real and intellectual property. OK, fair enough. But this is getting it's getting at and Max said this is where you'll come in. Like it's getting at this question of like a lot of these legal rights are not actually conferred in the smart contract itself. And they live in a terms and condition that live on the the project's website. And I really think that's what he's trying to get at. And it's the problem that I know he's trying to solve. Max, it's the problem you and Alex here are trying to solve, which is how do we actually start embedding these legal rights into the smart contracts themselves so that there isn't this vagueness. And Max, do you want to uh on, on that cue, chime yeah. in with your thoughts. Yeah. Well, th there's, I mean, so just, just initially talking, I think I briefly, briefly touched on it earlier. You know, the blockchain is this fantastic place for distributed ownership and it handles this concept of provenance of ownership of a token, which points to some sort of asset extremely well. So the concept of possession that Jeremy was alluding to, you know, if I own this asset, there is a you go to Etherscan and you see a seamless record of every single transaction, the purchase amount, how this asset transfers from one, or I should say how this token transfers from one holder to the next. Where there are some issues is where the actual asset is stored. And the argument I've been trying to make is that ownership of a token is handled beautifully by the blockchain, but all of these other constituent components of what is represented by that asset or by that token whether it's an asset, an image file, it's really some sort of permission. Because if you know every single person that uh, owns an NFT, every, everyone else has access to the exact same image file. But the issues around the legality of, of how that file is actually stored, how that file is actually transferred, there's, there's, not, um, there's not much precedent for. So the argument that I'm making is, I guess, from a value prop perspective, which is, yes, possession uh, on the blockchain is handled beautifully, but the legal terms which define what you can or cannot do with your asset are held in these legal contracts. So if I own a house and the blockchain basically says, I own this house, you know, it's located at this specific pit place, I, I purchased it for this amount, but I can't actually utilize my house because the legal contract is subjectively held by, you know, Alex, and he's now able to change the permissions of me interacting with my asset subjectively, willy-nilly, whenever he wants, 
what is the real value that I am imparting by owning this asset? So once again, it's asset, ownership of the asset, and permissions and rights associated to utilizing that asset. And those two need to be intertwined in a distributed fashion, in a decentralized fashion, for Web3 to actually come into itself. Because if you have people buying assets to gain access to all of this utility that they're supposed to have, you know, as defined in the terms and conditions, which are, yes, they're, they're held on uh, you know, people's websites, AWS, some of them are held on IPFS. Some of them, you actually see a link in the metadata of the, of the NFT. But I mean, this sort of brings up a whole slew of enforceability in relation to transferring assets and the ascent, the actual signature and awareness of buyers purchasing these assets. But fundamentally, if I'm buying something, those legal terms should be, de- should be defined at the time of sale. I don't so, want, you know, I buy an asset. I don't want Alex to change the floors of my house because he's decided to at some later point in time. That's not, that's not property, right? So what you're, you're getting at here is something that I, I want to push on this at the point of purchase piece, which is something Max, you've brought up to me before, which is, okay, there are these terms and conditions, hopefully that live on the website for one of these assets, for example, uh, you know, the Yuga Labs website will have their terms and conditions for board apes. But when I go to OpenSea and I go to buy a board ape, I'm at no point uh, asked to interact with those terms and conditions. I'm at no point asked to accept those terms and conditions as I would do when I get when I download iTunes or, or you know, any of the n- many times in our lives when we obviously have to sign TNCs. And what are the legal implications of that? So I want to bring in, you know, Jeremy and Daniel and Alex to to kind of provide that legal perspective on like are we bound by none of these terms and conditions as buyers because we are never forced to actually look at these terms and conditions? Definitely not. Just I'll, I'll, I'll pro- provide that uh, simple answer. So we're definitely but, not uh, bound by the terms and conditions, but I. But the important. No, no, you, de- de- you definitely there are a nexus to being bound by the terms and conditions to those downstream buyers, and there's well settled case law specifically for software. Uh, so we are usage. bound by the terms and conditions. I mean, not think necessarily. About it, well, think about it this way: you can only if I buy something from you, Carly, you can only sell me what you have. So if you have some kind of limitation that you acquired when your original purchase, you can't sell me something greater than what you have. And so, you know, that's, that's all you've got left to give to me. And the question is, what is that? Uh, I, 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 so one, I think there's, I think there's an important sort of um, higher level framework to talk about here. And, and here, here's what I mean. Um, one concept of NFTs and terms and licenses is, you have Mothership, which is issuing the project, and then you have Buyer A and Buyer B, right? You have the Buyer A who bought it at Mint, and then Buyer B buys it on the secondary market. One, I, one concept is, you know, the terms are, it's kind of easy to, to establish privity, meaning like a contractual relationship between Buyer A who bought it at Mint and, and, the, and the issuer, right? The question is, what about when it goes to B? What I mean by framework is, is A transferring rights or, or licenses from A to B, or is it the case that once A transfers their token to B, their rights with A are sort of cut off and a new relationship is is or could be formed between directly between the mothership, the issuer, and B. And there's not really, I understand that there is sell the token from A to B, but what about the license and the terms? My, my opinion, just my own personal, Jeremy's opinion is, Better in this world to establish the relationship directly at each time anew, afresh between A and the mothership and B and the mothership. What, what the question is though, well, it was easy at Mint to create that privity of contract. It was easy to create a click through. You're presented, there's a checkout. Like you, you present it with the terms at the Mint, you agree to them, you sign off, no problem. Now, what often that doesn't happen, but you're saying it would be easy to do easy, that. Projects just to need do. to start adding that when they mint it. And totally. Done. Yeah, totally. Mur- once- Murakami did it with their last um, flower sale. I will. Oh, there Murakami are some did. issues to, to to that as well, but but um, when but 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 fundamentally, that, 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 that is something that remaster is squarely focused on solving. Well, I'm going to yeah. say that. Oh, I'll, I'll, right. No, I, I. But the problem is, what about the secondary? What about the secondary sale? Yeah, secondary sale. Yeah, you could put maybe a link in the open sea terms, or you could do you know. But but those are once those NFTs are out in the wild. You know, you don't have to go through a secondary marketplace. You could do a direct transfer. So how do you possibly enforce that? And that's where 
there's two things I would say. One, we need a, a we need a platform. We need a solution that helps you know be able to create privity during those secondary sales situations. And I think that's part of what I understand Remaster to be doing. The other thing I would say though is that if there's a license that's part of those terms, right? If part of what those terms are is you have the rights to go make commercial use, let's say, of this artwork or this this PFP, and somebody down the line goes and takes advantage of that license. I think it would be difficult for them to argue, I'm not bound by the terms of those licenses. Because if they're taking advantage, kind of what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if you're going to take advantage of IP rights or other privileges or benefits that flow from the license, mm. I don't think a judge mm. in court is going to be like, oh, I never read the terms. I don't know what they say. You can't enforce them against me. That, that By the way, those are two that I wouldn't want to rely on that. If I'm representing a brand and I'm representing a client, I don't love that solution. I think it's very imperfect. That's why I think it is absolutely critical that we have infrastructure that allows there to be like definitive, absolute, unassailable privity in these situations for lots of different reasons. But just as a legal nerd principle, I'd say that there, yeah. in that situation, there might be an argument. Well, let, let's just assume, Jeremy, that because because I, I actually do understand that argument, like you've clearly read you know, the actual terms in order to be able to exercise some of these components of what are defined in the actual terms. So logically, you would assume that that person understood and agreed to those terms. But so let's just assume for the sake that that is enforceable. Now you have an NFT owner exercising some of these terms because the logic of transferability is determined on the blockchain. And there is no input of the actual legal intent in association to how that how that that uh, digital assets should transact on the blockchain, you now have this issue where someone could have the actual license because they have the legal enforceability, the permission to do so. And then as the blockchain is completely unaware of those permissions or those encumbrances of that asset, now sell that asset to a downstream buyer. And that downstream buyer is A, not in privity with any of the initial people because of some of the enforceabilities that we spoke about but also doesn't understand that his NFT is coming with certain encumbrances, certain liens, certain whatever it is associated to that asset. So when you go to buy a house, I know I bring up these housing analogies a lot, but you go to buy a house, you do a title check, you make sure there are no additional claims associated to your house. So you have this concept of title, which is defined in contracts, defined in course in these centralized entities and possession. Blockchain handles possession beautifully. We all know that. We all understand that. But it becomes a very, very murky situation. I mean, look at what happened with Seth Green and Bored Ape. Um, you know, his asset was stolen and the the fisher ended up selling the asset to uh, some downstream buyer who was completely unknown, unaware of the of the issue. So he is actually a good faith purchaser. He purchased the asset in good faith, you know, you know unbeknownst to him that it was actually stolen. So there are issues in order for the space to grow into itself, in order for it to actually scale beyond just what is happening right now, which is pure liquidity, because there's a real significant lack of enforceability and there are real issues in relation to how you actually retroactively enforce certain components when you can sell an asset 100,000 times in a week. Even if you had privity of all of those downstream buyers, if there's no logic associated to the actual NFT and the legal intent of that asset, you can have 100,000 valid signatures associated to an asset transaction. How do you litigate that? 100,000 people who should have never purchased an asset to begin with. So I unfortunately have to cut off this conversation, though I promise you we will do a part two because we have not really gotten into the solutions here. How can we good, good teaser. actually uh, solve this issue? Is this an issue that's going to be solved at the you know, platform level, like an open C level, or is it something that we can really solve at the smart contract level, at a protocol level? Where do the solves come in? So that'll be a lovely teaser for part two of this conversation. But I just want to say, I appreciate you all so much for coming on, unpacking these very thorny, complicated issues, raising these very thorny, complicated issues that do impact all of us who are in this space and who are in this space relying on these, uh, the utility pieces of of our assets, including things like our rights. So thank you all so much for joining. <laughs> I'm sorry to cut it short. And uh, no, thank you, Kai. Catch you all next this time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kai. Not the platform layer. 
<laughs> there you go. T- there's the punchline. I'm calling it the layer A, the authorization layer. That's what Remaster okay, uh, I like is that. focused on. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out. It helps the show out. And it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.